two questions came to mind. First, why does Hafez appeal as much as he does to many Iranian readers? Second question, what makes these strange texts strange to me um, in youth, in Mashhad, many years ago, what makes these texts poetic? And when I say strange, I was thinking, actually the first poem I read was Salah Kar Kojava Mana Harab Koja Bebin Tafavot Rah Kaz Kojas Tabek Koja. And I, whenever I sit down to read Hafiz, I use that couplet to remind me I may not know what I'm talking about. What the first Ghazal I read from beginning to end and tried to work out was uh, Ghazal number three in the handout that you all have. And what made the text strange to me was that I got on tour to Shirazi, but that's all right. Delamara, the Hale, and Duyash, Basham, Samarand, the Boharara, that, okay, love. Second couplet. بده ساقی می باقی که در جنت نخواهی آفت کنار آب رکناباد و گود گشت مسلا را That's not love. In fact, it's a strange notion for a medieval person who believes in God, believes in heaven, believes in spirituality to say Shiraz, is, and I'm not from Shiraz so I don't have a positive bias toward Shiraz. Shiraz is so good I don't want to leave it. Even Jannat, even heaven is going to not compensate me for Shiraz. Of course, there is a point here. If the moment is perfect, even if there are other moments that could be more perfect, you don't want to abandon this perfect moment. Then we have a couple of Hadith says, Motrebo Megu. What does that have to do with love? What does that have to do with loving Rok Nabad and Mosala? That's a third theme. Nasihat Gush Kun John, as John Dust Tar Daran Javanana Sahadat Man, Panda Pira Donaro. Well, that could be a fourth. Unless we put together Nasiat Gushkon and Hadiths Motreb. That is the old, the elder's advice is that. And then we get to the final couplet. As al gofti o dor softi bila va kosh bechon hafez kevar naz vato afshonad falak ek de sorayara. That's a fifth. And the only way they work as a totality, if we have five different themes or kinds of statements is if we imagine the door so tan and necklace making, in which case we can think of each couplet in this poem as being uh, one pearl in a necklace. But that's strange for an American in 1965. That is, texts that Americans read then, and they could be classical or medieval or modern, were texts that had some kind of organic or thematic, or chronological, other sort of unity. Well, I'll get back in a minute to um, what it is that I ended up thinking made what were initially strange texts poetic for me. Mm -hmm. As for the second, why did Hafiz Ghazal's appeal to so many people I met in Iran? I thought, well, maybe if I find out what the basis of Hafez's appeal to Iranians is, I might be able to figure out what's going on in the text that make them poetic. Well, I have to say I discovered when I made a list for myself of what it is that the Ghazals, what it is about the Ghazals that seem to uh, appeal so much to Iranians, I didn't find an answer to my question. I found some cultural information. And when I say cultural information, I can mean things that are comparative, that is, things happen in X place that don't happen in Y place. But for somebody in culture studies, when you say that, you don't mean that what happens in X or Y place is better, you mean it's just different. And so I want to give a little bit, uh, I want to give part of that list, and I think Bahram Mushidi exemplifies part of the list. 
That is, what things about Hafez really appeal to Iranians to the point where uh, they say that Hafez's poetry is kind of an embodiment of the national spirit. Maybe I'll start with that. Actually, that's item 9 or 10. This is a very interesting idea. But Hafez's poetry was famous for centuries before anybody thought for any reason or in any way that Hafez embodied the Iranian national spirit. In fact, during the Constitutional Revolution, people said, forget about Hafez. Poetry is for children. We've got to get beyond that stage. We have serious business. Uh, Ahmad Kassiri in his book, Hafez Chemigriad, represents that sort of idea. Then in 1904-1906, Edward Brown uh, wrote one of his volumes of a literary history of Persia, and in it he said that Hafez represented, embodied the Iranian national spirit. In 1928, uh, a writer by the name of uh, Hajir did a book called uh, Hafez Tashri, in which he picked up on this, and this Mr. Hajir ended up being a minister and um, prime minister and, and uh, uh, was assassinated by the same group of people who assassinated uh, Kasravi. Uh, he said, Hafez represents everything that our culture is all about. For me, that was an interesting discovery, that this didn't happen till the 1930s. Well, what were people reading Hafez for and enjoying him before that point? In any case, the reason why uh, people, and Mr. Moshiri has stated himself, he feels that way about Hafez, the reason why some people feel about Hafez has to do with the other uh, cultural issues that I find in Iranian appreciation of Hafez. For example, there seems to be a cultural predisposition of some Iranians to see mystery or find unverbalizable meaning in life and to revel in its depiction in literary art. But something else is going on beyond what we see. Benjamin Franklin didn't think that way. Uh, Frederick Douglass didn't think that way. Mark Twain didn't think that way. That is, Americans don't have to think that way. And so then we, and we see a, a representation of this in a text, in a uh, couplet that Mr. Moshiri, uh, I think, recited. Shabatariko bime mojo gerdabi chunin ha'el kojadanand ha'lema sabok barana sahela. And the Iranians I'm talking about, when they hear that, they go, mm, yeah. There is, yeah, this, I feel that way vis-a-vis -vis other people. Well, what does this text mean? It means if you have taken a boat out at night and you come back and describe for people who haven't ever been in a boat how horrifying it was, they'll say, what are you talking about? I drive my car up and down uh, uh, streets at night. That's one possibility. And remember, in literary art, when there's a possibility that has a picture in it, you can never forget that possibility. Just move on to things that take you somewhere else. The second is, uh, I'm a lover. I've fallen in love. It's more important than anything else I've ever done, but nobody else understands the situation I'm in. I feel like I've been through a ringer. Uh, I don't know what's going on. And the other people are saying, we've got to do something about Mike. He's acting strangely. Actually, they said that 45 years ago. They don't say it anymore about it, <laughs> for that reason, in any case. Uh, or this Shavitarik. What we have in history, in several cultures, the dark night of the soul. And the dark night of the soul can be a place you've got to get to before you can move up the ladder uh, in spirituality again. And I know many of you, when you look at Hafez or hear individual couplets recited, you have this feeling there's more there than meets the ear. That is also interesting because uh, Except for the three ghazals that uh, Mr. Moshidi read that were on the, the sheet of the text for the uh, discussion, he quoted individual couplets. And everybody kind of, yes, that is, that's interesting, that's deep, and what have you. But we have to stop and think. Uh, a poem is a text that's complete. Is a part of a poem necessarily a poem? Is it complete? doesn't have to be. But why is it that in the Iranian tradition for these people who love uh, Hafez, why is it their appreciation of Hafez 
usually means quoting couplets out of context. Because it's in those couplets they find the statements that say more than what they seem to say. A second feature uh, that I noted in uh, Iranian acquaintances' reaction to Hafez was what appeared to be uh, a cultural comfort or even a penchant for what I'll call ceremony, formality, ritual, and aesthetics of decoration, and performance. It's a long story, but let's just use the word tarof. And I mean it in a positive sense. But just stop and think of all the things that have happened for centuries in Iranian life that depend upon an appreciation of uh, formality, of ceremony of doing things in kind of a performance sense. And let's go back to another Hazal's evidence of this that Mr. Moshiri uh, read. We have the, in number one, Allah ya ayyuha saqi adar ka'san wa navil ha. I'm reading with Persian stress patterns uh, so that it fits the, quantita the qualitative meter in Persian poetry. Most Iranians think that only an aruz rhythm occurs in, there's long and short syllables in Persian poems, but in Hafez, it's been demonstrated that there is a da 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 da, an accentual pattern as well, and that depends upon keeping Persian words with the same stress patterns they have in conversation. That's another story. Why an Arabic line? And who is he saying it for and when? Well, it's at a wine party in court, and he's coming in, or somebody's coming in, and says this line, it's in Arabic. There's no other reason for it to be in Arabic. Actually, the line does occur in Arabi, and one other poet, the Yazid business, is irrelevant uh, to Persian poetry. But So they, those people in the court would have uh, also picked up on that. But this says them, hey, there's going to be some fun here. This is going to be stylish. This, I've cleared my throat and I'm saying this. And how does the poem end? In kind of a circular effect. Matamad talqa man Again, absolutely no reason for having that line be in Arabic, except for formality, except for performance. Am I saying that's good or bad? No, I'm saying it seems to be a cultural fact. A third example. Many Iranians appear to want there to be a spiritual experience in their reading of things that are serious. And Hafez offers more of it, they think, than other people. And they want to connect Hafez with Gnosticism, that is with Erfan, with Sufism. And even to argue that much of what Hafez says has meaning on a mystical level. Let's look at the text which Mr. Moshidi analyzed or explicated, uh, number 142. In that explication, uh, all of you seem to say, yes, yes, that's what's going on. But nobody said, what is Jama Jam? It's got to be something. And if I go to a Meijin elder who, by some kind of intuition, or because he's a representative of a religion that's been around a long time, and when there are problems that arise that can't be solved by going to your neighborhood preacher, since this Zoroastrian kind of is outside of town, there's some mystery uh, to uh, his practice, and there's an association with history, maybe he'll give, it doesn't mean I'm rejecting my religion, but maybe he'll have some kind of an answer that's not part of the regular rules and regulations. But I go to him and ask him for an answer, jaw majam, and this word ma, uh, Mr. Moshidi used the word we in his explication, I think of it as man, I. I was looking for something. I didn't know I had it myself. And so I was looking outside of myself for it. So we have to remember that. That is, in this text, we've got two selves. The one very logical self who can think that something's missing, and the other is the emotional self, the heart, mind and heart. Simply enough, in an everyday sophomore college uh, appreciation of the poem, which means lots is left out, but that's one level. But if the Magian Elder is going to give an answer, if the poem has to end, there has to be something in the text which shows an answer. 
poets usually do more showing than telling. They give us pictures for us to have the experience rather than tell us things and we're supposed to respond by uh, agreeing with them. And we're going to go to the, the uh, last couplet. Goftanish Zolfa chose the botan as pay a cheese. Mr. Moshedi uh, suggested that the meaning of Zanjir is what happens to crazy people. That is, they get tied up. Uh, the Iranian scholars uh, uh, who write commentaries in Iran have another view, and their view is, I've fallen in love. And when you're in love, you're kind of in chains. You're captured. I look at the beloved's hair, and the first thing the beloved's hair reminds me of is chains. It wouldn't remind me of chains unless I were in love. But because I'm captured by love, I can see that the snare of love, or the most appealing thing about the beloved, is chains. And when the speaker reveals that to the mage and elder, says, I get it now, and I'm going to give you an answer. But the answer he gives is not telling, but showing. Gov hafez gele'i as dele sheyda mikad. Sheyda, sheydai, somebody caught in the emotion of love. And the only thing different about Hafez and everybody else is his del is Shaydal. Let's go back to Jamajam, Gohar, Kadah Badir, Jamajahan Bean. To make a very long story short, it's the capacity of human beings to love. And some thinking human beings don't realize how important it is to, t to use that capacity. And so the answer is, you've got a mind, you're using your mind. But it's your heart that should be in first place. Even the Beatles have said that in a, a hundred songs. You've got to pay attention to your heart in order to have it. Well, does this mean it's uh, more than mundane love, loving some other person? Could be. Doesn't have to be. Could it be the love of a human being for the Creator? Yes. But in a text where we can get to that second or third stage, the text has got to say something. Now, um, the popular notion of um, the jam in question as being associated with Jamshid, and for me, popular notions are always better than history unless I'm an historian. Because what people actually think is more important than what actually happened. <coughs> That is, don't Iranians say something about, oh, remember, the ending of the Shah is the happy part, and they really believe that history had that in it. It's a fiction. Jama Jan. Actually, it wasn't a goblet, maybe. Maybe it was like a saucer, like the saucers they used to put in their Kamarbandit uh, Parchi, that is, they used to. And you take it out. But his was a little bit different. He was at the time of prehistory when he discovered things, invented things, saw things that could work in society. That is, in po the popular magic, he looked into, and maybe there was wine there, uh, he looked into that, and it was seven-ringed, and Jamshid's seven-ringed cup in Edward Fitzgerald's The Rubat of Hayam, and he came up with answers. Well, this speaker needs that kind of answer. So the speaker's got Adahibadeh, which is another John. And the speaker can see a thousand things, a myriad of things in it. Well, if you look into a wine glass or goblet, if you see anything, what do you see? You see yourself, if you see anything. But some of us, when we look into a wine goblet, we're kind of concentrating on the color and we don't see the reflection. And then we get a, a hint. That is, Hakim gave this when? At the very beginning of things. And we have plenty of stories from the Middle Ages of how it is human beings accepted the amonat, the burden and the responsibility of love, as other celestial creatures could not. And we have here the likelihood. Uh, Mr. Moshedi uh, interpreted Ruhul Qudos as the Holy Ghost. Uh, the critics in Iran say it's the angel Gabriel who would inspire uh, Christ the same way uh, he's supposed to have inspired um, Muhammad.
Number four. Hafez reminds me of the famous uh, conductor of the Boston Pops, Arthur Fiedler who when he was 80 years of age was still conducting the Boston Pops and there was a, on PBS there was a, a, a presentation of one of the performances. And he was backstage like this, 80 years of age. And somebody said to him, Maestro, you're on. And he walked out to the stage. In other words, he refused in public to have time to feed him. When he was on his own, he was tired and he was older. Well, Hafez doesn't show us ever this character. That is, Hafez is determined from the beginning to the end of his career. He can have days where he thinks he's not going to achieve what he wants, but he doesn't have any days where he, his body language tells us he's given up. And I don't have to speak a paragraph to say why that would be so interesting and culturally significant for Iranians in lots of periods of Iranian history. For example, in 255, that is, I'm supposed to be happy, well, I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a believer in anything. Why should I believe that? Of course, that brings another thing into play that is from the American perspective of looking at poems. Uh, in Iranian culture, another of the items I could uh, mention uh, is that traditional Iranian poets, especially Ferdowsi, Hafez, maybe a little bit less Saadi because he's kind of practical, uh, and Rumi, uh, are people whose words some people believe, or they want to believe, because they expect their poets to be better than other people. In fact, some people expect their poets to be guides. They expect their, their poets to be philosophers. They expect their poets to know more about psychology than other people. Well, as a 21st century American, I say poets don't know anything about psychology or they'd be psychologists. Poets don't know anything about philosophy or they'd be philosophers. Poets are in the poetry business. Which means it doesn't make any difference to me if in a poem a poet says something with which I do not agree the point is, can the poet bring alive the experience about which the poet has had feelings and I momentarily put on his clothes and his shoes and enjoy that experience and when I leave the text I don't change my mind about things. But I will say it's a true, I'm saying this is American, I'm not saying right or wrong, it's American. In Iranian culture, uh, people think that what Hafez says, some people think that what Hafez says is true. Well, I look in this poem, Yusuf the and If I were a Muslim, because God is telling me this in a book of Revelations, I would say, well, there could be another Joseph. Another can. In fact, the whole story of Joseph is a story of if you follow the law, if you uh, worship God appropriately, if you have the right expectation of mercy, you're going to get what you deserve. But well, what does that do for somebody who doesn't have that sense about things? Or, for example, Garche Manzel Bas Katanak Asto Mapsad Bas Fahid Hich Rahinis Kondra Nist Payan Amahor. Is that actually true? Let's say I'm not a physicist. Why should I think the world is going to end? Who says the world's going to end? But if there's one road that's not going to end, death is a road that's not going to end, heaven is a road that's not going to end, but all kinds of roads aren't going to end. So I don't have a reason actually to, to believe that as well. I, I mention it for the optimism part. That is, that's what he has. And if I'm predisposed to accept that kind of view of things, I will. Now from the poetry side, uh, if he brings alive this Arthur Fiedler, Hafez and Shiraz attitude of this is the way I see life and I'm going to move forward. Uh, I experience that, I enjoy that, and it makes for what we call a poetic experience. 
uh, Mr. Moshidi referred to Ebhamat, referred to ambivalence, and I think mentioned in the context of, uh, of love. I'd like to mention in another context, if you look at uh, 26, couplet number six, Ansha'u, that is God, Ansha'u rich bepeymane ye ma nushidim. اگر از خمر بهشت است و اگر از باده مست It can be two things, wine. Whatever we take wine to be. The many things we take wine to be. It can be the alcoholic content uh, Merlot from Sonoma Valley or it can be a, an emblem for inspiration, intoxication at several levels, reduction of inhibitions, uh, carpe diem, dam ganimati, all kinds of things. It was, it's not unique to Hafez in poetry, but it's special to Hafez in the Persian literary tradition. And my experience of some Iranians who have talked about it is they think of their own cultural lives as involving uh, dipolarities, as involving sometimes mutually irresolvable conflict, tensions, doganagi uh, in general. I mean, how many Iranians besides yourself do you know who are very with it today and have special feelings about history that took place 2,500 years ago? Americans don't have special feeling about history that took place in the 1930s. The Achaemenids, oh, the Sasanids, oh, the Safavids, oh, medieval Persian poetry. Meanwhile, your job, your life, everything else is completely modern, if you will. Remember, this isn't good or bad. It just means that we have a culture in which we, the leading wordsmith actually voices the kinds of feelings people have about uh, parallel, parallel sorts, sorts of uh, personal uh, views about things. Springtime goes without saying. That is a special food. That is when I first got to Iran. People said, "You can't wait. We can't wait till springtime." I said, "Springtime, bring on the summer." Then I went. I went through a summer, which uh, was like here, except without the without the humidity. Uh, and then I got into the mood of springtime. Yes, yeah, springtime is the one time of the year when nature approaches the ideal. It's greener than other times of the year. Then I started realizing that architectural decoration on mosques, Persian carpet designs, illuminated manuscripts, pretty much everything else about Iranian culture that wasn't happening in spring was a way in which springtime could be kept alive all year round. It's not for nothing that Sadi's Golestan has eight books or is called Golestan, and we wanted to pick a title for another book of his. He chose Busan. It's not for nothing that springtime figures in Hafez and Ghazals they can give a kind of cultural comfort to people. Let's go back to number one. I've, I guess I'm pretty much out of time. I'm coming up to 35 minutes. Um, that's our number one. For the American reading Persian poetry, history's not important. Music's not important. Love's not important. Sufism's not important. All that's important is what's in the text that makes me leave the text temporarily to find out a context that I can then use and come back in the text. I actually chose these three texts to make certain no history was in them just so you wouldn't have a discussion about historical backdrop or whether the text was panegyric, that is praise of a patron or a king or what have you, or something political or historical. Remember, if you look at Encyclopedia Islamica under the name Hafez, and then look on uh, in the section called Hafez's Life and Times, this is how much there is on Hafez's life. We know nothing about Hafez's life according to the Iranian experts. Absolutely nothing. Married, not married, what kind of a briefcase he took to work to court, uh, how many poems he had to do at court. We know not, did he ever get sick? 
Did he ever travel? None of this stuff. Well, again, from the American perspective, it's not particularly significant because it's like smelling a rose or looking at a painting. Now, if I know roses, I'm going to have a richer experience, but I can have a good enough time just with the rose uh, by itself. If I know something about the kind of painting I'm seeing in a musician, uh, in, in a museum, I'll appreciate more about what's going on in the painting, as you do if you know music, listening to a piece of music. But music is there for those of, our, of us who aren't experts, as paintings are, as these poems are. So in American terms, I looked at this text 40 years ago, and I keep looking at it when I talk about it in, in classes. Uh, it's stylized, it's formal, it's, a, you have to, it's an acquired taste, so it took me longer to acquire it since I was a grown-up before I first saw it. Can this be about God? Why would love of God be easy at first and harder later? Marjorie Kemp doesn't say so. St. Augustine doesn't say so. Julian of Norwich doesn't say so. That is, the Western mystics don't say so. It was their getting to the point where they loved God that was hard, that is, giving up the other things, not that loving God was hard. This text could be a poem in its own right. Uh, we're invited to disregard the rules if somebody who has experienced things beyond the rules tells us. It can literally be pouring wine on a prayer carpet, but it means for us to uh, analogously to do something in our lives if we think that by doing that, we'll get expertise we don't otherwise have. If somebody's in love, if that's what this is about, it would mean that uh, you don't want to express your love in the way you feel you should express it because of what your neighbors are going to think, your classmates are going to think, your coworkers are going to think, your family's going to, what your family's going to think. But you've got to risk the opprobrium, the disapproval of people uh, by following your heart and your guide, and this is relatively Iranian in, in comparison to American, by following somebody, in fact, I wish it worked in America, I wish the older you got in America, the more students respected you. Uh, that's one of the mistakes I made was coming back to the United States, uh, being in Persian literature. Uh, in any case, the elder is there as somebody whom you can trust, because after all, in the Middle Ages, if you were older than other people, you were smarter because it wasn't easy to get old and live and survive well. A trip is مرا در منزل جان آنچه امن ایش چون هر دم جرس فریاد می دارد که بر بندی محملا Can this be God? Well, actually, I wouldn't have thought of God from the very beginning of the poem, except I know a predisposition. That is, if we have in this world a manzella janan, and there's a jaras which is going to take me out of this caravanserai in this world, then this love, it can be deep, but it can't be metaphysical. It can't be spiritual. It can't be Gnostic. Does Hafez have such texts? Lots. But the evidence here doesn't seem to suggest that that's the experience He's communicating to us. Hamid Karam Zakhud Kami, the bad Nami Kashid Akhir, Nahan came on ad, on Razik as U Sazan, as An Sazan Mafalha. I'm sure it's probably not true about Iranian social gatherings, but many of the reasons for American social gatherings is to talk about people who aren't there. I'm sure it doesn't happen in Iranian gatherings, but, but American gatherings, I have to confess, it happens. So he has what? His behavior as a lover has caused him to lose his reputation. And his chod kami is not the chod kami of chod khahi, it's what will fulfill him is in fact uh, to be allowed to be generous in loving someone else and to have it reciprocated. He can't keep his internal state, the state of his heart, a secret uh, because sooner or later people at these gatherings figure out what somebody else has been doing and why. They put two and two together, they compare notes, and uh, the thing is no longer a secret. Now, Mr. Moshidi said that Huzuri and um, 
Beibat, Ayyad Budan, are Sufi terms. Yeah, they're Sufi terms and Sufi poems. We haven't been asked that in this text. In this text, we've been asked, you're, you're here, he or she is not here. But when it says, Qayyab Masho Hafez, this might not be the literal Qayyab of not being here. It means you have to be vigilant. You have to always be present in mind, present in spirit. You never can forget about uh, the beloved if you expect any kind of presence or proximity from the beloved. And then, uh, when you meet the person you desire, let the world go, give it up. We'd like to be able to do that. We don't. But that may be another culturally appealing. And Hafez didn't do it. He went home to his wife and kids. Maybe. We don't know anything about, uh, about his life. But he's thinking if, if you could do it, you'd do it. But you can't. But you have a nice experience when you read about somebody who says you could do it. It's cheering. It's energizing. Thank you.